exciting. All right, so second panel of the conference. Um, this time, you know, focusing really on UX for everyone and the discussion around inclusivity and accessibility uh, for our games. And we have a fabulous panel. Many of them you've already met today and you've heard from them today. But we have one new addition. This is Steve Saylor. Hi. And Steve is the blind gamer. So... <laughs> Hi. I wish I could see all your lovely faces, but I can't, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we really felt that for this panel to really have a great discussion, why not include the end user in the discussion? So that's where we've gone to. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to just start off with a really general question that we talked about, but you know, why create UX for everyone? Um, Bryce, I, want, I would like you to start. Um, Is it? Is this thing on? Oh, it is on. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, I mean, I, I said this this morning, and at Microsoft, you know, our mission is to em empower everyone, and we take that really literally. So um, I'm fortunate enough to be able to be in this position to, um, to actually be able to focus on that. So that's, that's why it is important in the sense of that we meet so many people that are excluded from our experiences, and we just want to make sure that we're empowering everyone. <laughs> yeah, and I think you also said something really interesting was it should work for each of us. Yeah. I and mean, I really like that idea and that concept. Yeah, I mean, especially with digital experiences, um, we think about inclusive design and universal design slightly differently. Universal design, like curb cuts, mm -hmm. um, those are things that work well for everyone. But with inclusive design, what we're trying to do is make things really personal, right? Um, another thing, another term that we throw around a lot uh, at Microsoft is this idea of more personal computing. Mm -hmm. and, and being inclusive is part of that, like making experiences that fit you. The panel, anyone else have some, something to add? Um, I already said it, like, recently, but I would scream it from a mountain that, um, you know, it's our job as UI UX people to make um, our content usable. Um, I get asked pretty frequently, um, another thing that I kind of didn't mention before, like what's the financial like benefit, I guess, of doing this? And the reality of that is when you exclude a large group of users, they're not necessarily going to buy the content. And so there is no real way to quantify that um, unless you make the product and cater it towards them and then suddenly you have a loyal fan base that didn't exist before. Um, so that is from a financial perspective if that's important to you, especially if you're a small company trying to figure out like how to make this work, that's a pretty important thing to consider that now you're going to have users that you would not have had before. Uh, and yeah, and I would say like even for, for myself, I, I guess not being a game developer, I am kind of like the end example of why UX is important for everyone because uh, whenever I'm playing a game, it is hard for me to be able to play a lot of like really complex games. And it's more because like it just gets frustrating for me to be able to, I can't have the same experience that other gamers uh, have. And whenever anyone tries to be able to include at least a little bit of accessibility within a game, I almost feel like that that feature was created just for me. And when I see that, and, it's, and it surprises me, and I use it, and it works so well, I will become the biggest fan of your game ever, and I will shout it from the mountaintops as this is an amazing game because it allowed me to do this. Uh, I used the example of um, for the Nintendo Switch. I wasn't too impressed with it when I first saw uh, the, like, the trailer for it. I was like, okay, great, yeah, people playing around with it on a rooftop somewhere. Um, but for, uh, for me, it was like one-two switch. It doesn't seem like it's a game that would be worth anything because we Sports, okay, that's that version. But when I got a chance to play it with my friends, the fact that it, like, it, it, may, it could have been intentional, it could have been unintentional, but the fact that there was a lot of huge text on the screen, everything was audio cues, and I was able to basically play with my friends at the same level that they are, and it made me feel like I was included and that I was a normal gamer in of itself. And so I am, I will gladly say that I am a, the biggest fan of the one, two switch. And I carry it with me almost all the time to kind of showcase, this is what this platform can do. And this is why I like it. And I will become, I am now a big, the biggest Nintendo switch fan 
uh, ever, and I will gladly uh, be able to say to everybody, definitely check out that game. I know it's eight. I know it's expensive. I know it should have came with the system, <laughs> but I definitely recommend at least checking that out if you really kind of want to see, a, a, for me, a perfect example of accessibility uh, in games. Um, yeah, I mean, I think everyone's covered the bases there. I, I mean, you can sort of split the argument up into three pieces, right? So there's the, um, you know, there's the general, so, you know, there's the, the moral case, right? You know, obviously, everybody should just as a, as a principle be able to uh, be able to enjoy all of these experiences. It's just, you know, a thing we should accept. Um, if that doesn't work for you, then, you know, there's the, well, you know, if you love games, and why wouldn't you want to share them with everyone as well? But then there's also, you know, the business case, like I mentioned in my talk. Um, lots of people have made that sort of argument about the bottom line. Um, one example I can think of is uh, Tom Abernathy's talk in the GDC Narrative Summit, maybe 2014, I want to say. Um, he made a really good business case for, um, for inclusivity um, and accessibility. So, yeah, I mean, I think that it just, it just makes sense, right? Um, the other thing I want to point to, so we're uh, while we're talking about inclusivity, um, one of the things that, uh, so one of the reasons as well that I've sort of wound up in the tool space um, rather than just sort of making games um, is also to sort of empower creators as well, include creators in the, in the sort of, you know, more types of creators who maybe there's people who didn't necessarily, you know, people who are writers who didn't necessarily want to write for games before, but maybe now want to do more interesting character-driven stuff, right? So kind of that's another impetus for, for me, certainly. I, you know, it's funny because you you do we do we're touching on it here, but at the end of the day, you know, it is hard to find time. And I think Alex, you were maybe talking about this in your talk for the producer to green light um, certain features. If you're you know, how do you sell it through, right? So I don't know if you know, Alex, you kind of gave your thoughts on it. I wonder if anyone else on the panel, either uh, Mitu or or Bryce, has thoughts on you know how do you how do you successfully make the business case. Um, with your producer or with your team to say, you know, we, we really need to do this when there's sort of a resistance. Because at the end of the day, you've got to ship a game, right? I mean, I've been fortunate enough to sort of work um, on just like, you know, tiny indie teams or for myself or, you know, et cetera. So I haven't had to navigate the sort of big corporate uh, sort of maze. Um, so maybe you could sp speak to... Well, I, actually, it's interesting. I mean, most of the majority of my work is platform. Mm -hmm. So my solution and our solution to that from our end is we're trying to figure out how we can put more of this on the platform so that you don't have to build it. Like what can we do as a platform provider to make it easier for you to make your content accessible? Right, and then it's just available to every developer on every game to help more people play. That's I mean, I will say that, um, again, from the indie perspective, though, I mean, the flip side of it is it can be more difficult, right? If you are a small team who has very limited resources, um, you know, you kind of have to make the business case to yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, why you should do these things. So, um, yeah, you know, it kind of goes both ways. There's difficulties on both sides there. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about, you know, what does maybe inclusive and accessible mean to you in the context of games? Maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, Mitu, you want to start with that one? What does inclusive and accessible mean? Um, I think that, I mean, inclusive, again, like I mentioned in my talk, um, inclusive is really about creating experiences which, um, you know, it's not, it's not enough to just have diversity, right? Diversity um, is for maybe, I don't know, like, you know, maybe that's for like marketing people to worry about or whatever, where it's like, okay, are we bringing in um, this segment of fans and are we, you know, do we have this demographic coverage, for example? Um, but then once you bring them in, like, you know, if you're not actually creating experiences which are meaningful, meaningful to them in some way or make them feel uh, included, then, you know, it's not, uh, it's not really gonna work. I mean, I think in some ways, inclusivity is, it sounds really silly to say, it's the opposite of, you know, actively excluding people. And there's been a lot of things in games, historically, which have actively and aggressively excluded people. So maybe the lack thereof. Yeah, I would add to that that I think, to me, it just means that make, getting to a point where it just feels completely normal to see a woman of color uh, lead character in a game, where you don't look down the Twitter comments and see people talking about how we're trying to push an agenda because we're representing a person who makes up a huge population of the world, or a percentage of the population of the world, 
Um, so the fact that people still comment like, oh, you're trying to be political, you're trying to push this, just because we have two women of color in a game, um, that to me means that we still have like a lot of ways to go with um, diversification and in, in being inclusive. Yeah, and I, I think, so, you know, your point earlier around um, diversity is kind of the outcome of being inclusive. I think accessible is also the outcome of being inclusive, right? So it all sort of starts from that place. Yeah, I like, I like what uh, you said, Bryce, about that it's gaming is for, is for everyone. Um, and it's, but like, I get it. I'm like, I am privileged the fact that I am a white male, so I, I'm already inclusive in that regard. But, and I'm not expecting any, like a, a main character of a game to be blind, um, although that'd be kind of interesting to see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd, be, I'd be interested to play that. Uh, but I, I think that, it, it, I like that aspect. It's like, gaming is for, is for everybody, and it was tough for me growing up because there wasn't a lot of games that I could play. I, would, I fell into the Let's Play genre on YouTube because I used to watch my brother play the video games that I love because I could never be able to play them myself. Uh, and so I, that nostalgic factor of it, that's what got me into it and wanted to be able to create it for myself. Um, so being able to pick up a game at any given point and be able to like, feel like that, uh, that I am included by being able to play the game uh, and that it's accessible to me, that to me is, uh, is, is awesome. Actually, that, that leads to a really you know, good question. You know, maybe each of you could share um, a good or bad experience where, um, you, know, where, where you had a... a good or bad UX, inclu or inclusive or non-inclusive UX really made a big impact on you, either making or playing? Oh, I was like, it was okay if I Okay, I have to preface this by saying it's, it, it's, it's not you, it's me situation. Um, <laughs> but if there's two, like, again, I've already mentioned the good example, uh, one, two, switch, that's a really good example for me. Uh, unfortunately, a bad example uh, is I, I, I was playing the first Uncharted, um, and <laughs> I didn't You're work on friends. it. I know, I know. You're I know, still I know. friends. It's okay. But no, because this is because this was funny to me. And Safe there's, place. I, I assume a lot of people played it. There's that that tomb that you go into the first time, and there's that cylindrical sort of like cavern that you have to kind of jump from ledge to ledge on the walls to be able to slide down this one vine. I died 20 times just to probably try to be able to do that, and that was the funniest thing to me. But I could see where that could, like could be like extremely like fr frustrating. Um, and then the, the second example, again, it's not you, it's me, uh, in Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Um, <laughs> it okay, was... wait, did you, do you have a Microsoft example? <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I have a bunch. Uh, <laughs> Halo Reach was hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dave. Um, <laughs> I, let's just pick on everybody. Why there not? Is. Okay, right yeah. There. Let's uh, let's let's burn bridges as we go. Um, it was uh, again. It was. It was, it was Black Flag. I love that story. I love that game. I am a huge Pirates fan, so I'd like being able to play it. But when I'm having two ships attack me, and I'm having to be able to, uh, to, be able to try to be able to accelerate my ship, but also turn it so it doesn't run into an island, but then also like moving from one side to another, be able to shoot my cannons, while two ships are still shooting at me, I was like, my hand was like this claw, and I just couldn't, like, I, I just didn't have the eye-hand coordination to be able to go about it. And again, that, I know that that's like, it's like only a situation that I would be in, but it was it, it was hard. <laughs> I'm calling I'm the creative sorry. director. We're gonna we're, yeah, I'll, I'll get him to revisit that. This is how this stuff happens, though. It's like you didn't think about that, and then you actually talk to consultants or talk to people in the community, and you're like, oh shit, yeah. like, I didn't it's true. I didn't even consider that um, because yeah, I don't really have anything to add to that as far as something negative or positive for me because I'm privileged. I'm an able-bodied person, so I never had to think about that um, prior to speaking to people in this community. So, And still, it still requires me, even though I've thought so much about it through Uncharted, I still continue to speak to people in the community because, like I said, it's easy to forget. It's easy to just not realize things like this. Um, I'm trying to, since I talked about character creation, I'm trying to think of um, any particularly egregious examples. The only thing that's coming to mind, and this is kind of a, this is me, kind of situation. Um, so my first MMO was EverQuest, and EverQuest is still kind of like the game of my life. Like, I just still, I, yeah, so much, so much of my, uh, of my late teens went to that. Um, but I remember the very first time I loaded up EverQuest, and I was on the character creation um, screen, and I was, um, and I wanted to create a, um, a human female character. 
Um, and I was kind of, you know, going through the options, and I was like, oh, I think she looks, um, she looks kind of, and I was like, you know, I, and because I knew that this was, uh, you know, I was super excited about the fact that this was going to be a world that I inhabit, um, which is, you know, um, persistent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I was like, I kind of want to make myself, right? So I was like looping through the options, and um, I was like, oh, she looks, she looks kind of tan. Um, and I was like running around uh, West Freeport um, with this character, and I was like, it's pretty, pretty dark here in West Freeport. Um, and then I went into the settings, and I turned the gamma up, and, um, and the character was like super white, super blonde. <laughs> 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 and did not look like me. Um, and I was like, oh wait, the only, um, yeah, so the only people of color in EverQuest were um, a particular race, the Erudites. Um, so yeah, anyway, that was my, <laughs> that was my story. Do you think that um, if you were able to, you know, create something that looked more exactly like you, that you would have had better engagement in the game or enjoyment in the game? And you know, why is it even important that we 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 look at these kind of diversities if storytellers want to tell certain stories? Is it even important? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that you know, I don't think it's wrong for people to want to see themselves represented. Right, I think that people should be, and you know, and I've obviously I've played games all my life, and I have no problem relating to characters who don't look like me. Like you know, that is a thing we can do. We have human <laughs> empathy, who, and we can sort of extend out our sense of embodiment to uh, to anyone, or you know, relate to any character. But you know, just occasionally, you know, I think it struck me at some point in my life. Wait a minute, like my my white male friends don't necessarily have to think about this, right? You know, they don't have to think about. Um, not seeing themselves. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's definitely important. Um, when I was a kid, I idolized Jane Goodall. I wrote her letters and things, and she actually wrote me back. Jane That's Goodall, awesome. I, I, I'm assuming everybody knows who she is, but she works with chimpanzees, and she's, like, the most amazing person on earth. Um, but I ended up going to school for sciences before I got into art, um, and it was, like, it started with that. Like, I saw a woman doing a thing that I thought was so cool, and there is something real about that, especially to a child, to see somebody doing a thing that they really admire, who looks like them, makes you feel like, I can do that too. And I'm sure you've all experienced this, men, women, everybody in here, you see that person, that character, Indiana Jones or whoever, you're looking at, you're like, yeah, that's cool, I wanna, I wanna be just like that guy. Um, and I think that has a really real impact on people. And so you have to consider, if there's a group of people who do not have that, what does that say? Definitely. So I think the way that I come, I mean, representation is super important. And I, mean, I think we all want to see ourselves in games. And, and I know Alex and I have been talking a lot about accessibility today. But there is a certain aspect of representation that we do too. So when, Steve, you talk about, like, there, you don't want to be the blind player in the game, I actually am honestly, genuinely, like, why not? Like, um, you know, we had a, we, there, are, there are a lot of really interesting opportunities to explore new types of game modalities mm -hmm. through representation. Like um, Wolfenstein, you know, the, the beginning of the new Wolfenstein trailer where you're playing in a wheelchair and they say, oh, it plays just like the regular game. I'm like, oh man, wouldn't it be cool if it actually played like you were in a wheelchair, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like what, how does that change the game? And I think that's when we can start to look at representation as a way to, this might be a little bit far-fetched, but when we think of representation as a way to re-experience these games from a different point of view, it becomes really powerful. Mm -hmm. You know what? We're going to open this up to some questions for our lovely panel. We want to have a good discussion today, and I'm sure a lot of you have thoughts on um, inclusivity or accessibility or, you know, just have comments. Uh, so we'd like to open it up to the room. If anyone has questions. While people are getting up, I just want to yes. um, add to the sort of representation point. I think for me, the thing I realized that I've always done is this kind of weird fuzzy matching process of like which character <laughs> is the most like me, right? Um, yes. <laughs> so, you know, like, oh, Street Fighter, I'm going to be Chun-Li because, you know, it's the woman, um, etc. And like, and so actually with EverQuest, I actually ended up going to Dark Elves, interestingly. <laughs> <laughs> Says a lot. Mm, yeah. <laughs> also because I'm evil, but yeah. <laughs> I've got a question. I'm wondering if we would all benefit as developers and in turn our players if each of the major platform manufacturers, Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, in the dev kit mode, because we know all the dev kits have their own dev kit modes, if they just in hardware supported the various colorblind simulation options or in hardware supported high con mode, because a lot of the teams don't 
have you know, direct access or don't have the time to create all the pre-scan out pixel shaders to do all of that stuff, but if it was just embraced at the hardware level, we might be able to better simulate across all of our testers what the different colorblind scenarios might be. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a really cool idea, and I'm gonna take it. Um, <laughs> but I also, you know, as I said earlier, simulations is, is you know, is kind of tricky. You still really want to talk to people. But yeah, it's, it's a definitely a good idea of what kind of tools we can offer developers. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And like, there are actually, um, for anyone that's interested in, in finding access to those like filters and things that I was talking about, there are people that make those open source. And I was talking to somebody out in the hall about how, just like Steve just said, the accessibility community, if you go to them and are like, hey, I'm trying to make my game um, you know, more accessible, they will jump on that. And anyone that's making these tools is going to want you to have access to the tools, simply because there's so few games that put such a focus on um, accessibility. Uh, so I think that's an amazing idea. I hope Microsoft does it. I hope Sony does it. I hope Nintendo Switch gets on board. Uh, because yeah, I think that's an excellent idea. And it also kind of, that's gonna constantly remind developers that this is a thing that they should be thinking of. I mean, in particular with colorblindness, to um, Karen Stevens, who does accessibility for EA, um, she actually, like, put out the source code for her, the EA Madden, mm. like, colorblind settings. So you can just ask her and she'll, I think she'll give them to you. She gave them to me. <laughs> so. You can kind of see that, like, I mean, he works for Microsoft, I work for Sony, like, the people that are involved in accessibility, it kind of transcends, and also, like, inclusivity in general. I don't give a shit about like the console wars <laughs> or whatever. It's like, it's really great to have somebody else um, or other people that are interested and involved in this. So the community of people that are working on this tend to be pretty giving with um, the content that they're creating. Hi. Um, so kind of as you just said, no one really would be against accessibility or a larger audience. And yet these features don't get implemented or they're on the plan, but then they get cut or scope gets reduced. So what do you think are the greatest barriers to these things actually being implemented? Does talking about creating a bigger audience or a more inclusive one, an inclusive game, actually change people's minds? Or, or like, how are we going to solve that problem? I honestly feel like it's lack of resources. Like Anyone here that works on a dev team knows just how tight time is on these things. And so if you haven't considered it from the very beginning, now you're looking at a game that's probably had scope cuts already. Um, adding things that, at first glance, when you first look at what it takes to make a game barrier free, it's like, this is so much work. Like, it's just, mm -hmm. and it's daunting. So for somebody to see that, when you break it down into little chunks, like anything, it becomes really manageable. But when you're looking at this as a whole, I think people just panic at the, like, producers just, like, cold sweat over <laughs> it. Like, you're adding more work for literally every department. Like, every single department has to be involved from the beginning in order to make a game 100% barrier free, like un a game like Uncharted barrier free. I like what actually what you said you were talking about. It started off with adding a few features uh, and as you went along from each game to game. Mm -hmm. And like I always, uh, I always like the, the adage of like, you think big, but scale small. Like if it, it always starts with one step at a time. Um, and yeah, it'd be great to be able to ha like see your game accessible to all right out, uh, right out of the gate. But if, uh, if that's, that is sometimes not a reality. Um, so for for myself, like if I see again, if I see a little thing in there, um, you're you're already starting to win me over with a lot of goodwill, and I would be willing to keep going with that iteration if you if you're able to keep adding as you go. Um, I, I will also add, you know, there is some benefit, especially if you are a smaller studio. I mean, I'm a little bit biased, obviously. I want things to be inclusive. Um, but household games, local shop, way of the passive fist, yeah. they got a ton of great press and because they did a ton of really amazing work in, in making their game more accessible. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's absolutely true. It, it leads to a, another good question, though, is a good, you know, when, ideally, should you start talking about accessibility? Is it at the very beginning or is it possible to kind of do it along the way? What do you think? Uh, I feel like we need to do it super early because on Uncharted we started kind of too late. So that's mm -hmm. why during my talk I was like, would have been cool to do this one, but we did this one instead. Uh, yeah, there's like a ton of features that we would have loved to implement, but you just, 
again, like that's time, that's resources, that's involving like sound, which is kind of most, most pressed for time towards the end uh, of a production cycle. So I'd say in the earliest stages of pre-production, uh, you have to start planning for it and get production involved and get everybody kind of on board to do it. I mean, I'll add to that in that, you know, if you are gonna start early and you should, obviously, um, feel free to like limit your scope you know, yeah. <laughs> because you can, it's really easy to get into this kind of analysis paralysis kind of space where you're like, where you're, where you're being so intentional, you're not actually doing anything. You're being so, you're thinking of all these things that you could do that you don't actually start. So, you know, give yourself some room. You can also mess it up. Like we mess it up so many times, just like UI, UX in general, you mess it up and then you test it and then you're like, oh, that was the worst idea I've ever had. And then you like, keep going until finally at the end, it's like, it's not the worst, but it's like, maybe not the best. Uh, so it's like fitting it into any other similar pipeline. You don't have to like, get it exact out of the gate. I think for indies, like a good, <clears throat> a good sort of mental exercise might just be uh, sort of asking yourself, okay, this particular decision, who is it excluding, right? Rather than how am I specifically being inclusive? So like, for example, um, okay, like, Maybe let's not have uh, rapidly alternating flashing lights, for example, right? <laughs> um, things like that. So yeah, just asking yourself at every step of the way, like who, who am I actively excluding? I think just did that. Oh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so the talks about uh, inclusive, inclu inclusive bid, inclusivity and uh, representation would, um, got me thinking about like sh entire genres. So like. I personally was never really interested in the first person shooter genre until Overwatch came out. And I was like, hey, this is really fun and I'm really good at it. And now I play like PUBG and all that kind of stuff. But I think because like a lot of the first person shooters were really themed around like war and like stuff that I don't really um, relate to. I was wondering if you guys think that uh, like the theming of a game or a genre could bring more inclusivity and representation to a genre. Yeah. Okay, great question. Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, and I think the problem often with, you know, with, with like, you know, military shooters, et cetera, is like, it's not, and yes, there's definitely a big subsection of people who get ex excluded by those themes. But I think, you know, we can also just do better with those themes, right? Um, you know, just the idea of, again, characters being disposable. Right, you know, and I don't want to be all. What if you could talk to the monsters? But what if you could, like, <laughs> uh, you know, what what if um, the idea of uh, an NPC who you are, you know, who is meant to be like an enemy, it, and what if they actually had more depth to them? Right? What if they were sort of you know fully fledged human <coughs> beings and not just these sort of tokens? Um, and let's face it, like often in certain military shooters, they're represented in a very particular way, uh, which dehumanizes uh, vast swathes of people. Um, you know, what if we could have just better stories like that? So I absolutely agree that, you know, we do need to, and that goes back to um, having, building tools for more creators as well, right? So more, uh, the more we empower more groups of people to make these experiences, the better. You actually brought up PUBG, which I think is a super interesting game that's obviously being talked about a lot right now, in that there's so many different ways you can play that game and actually win. Uh, so the only time I've ever come even close to winning a PUBG round, I hid behind an open door in a bathroom and the circle just like closed on me and I was like, hell yeah. Yeah, I'm, nice. yeah, I'm winning at PUBG, zero yeah. kills, number two. I seem to uh, <laughs> I seem to survive by like dinner. crawling through the grass. Oh man, I, I hide in so many bushes. <laughs> yeah. Like the best way to play PUBG. But I love how people who don't normally play shooters can really, like it's got such a great uh, learning curve in it. Like where you can, you can feel cool and like you're winning uh, even though you're kind of just hiding in a bathroom. Uh, <laughs> But what a Winner. great way to like sort of start including more people um, that don't normally play the game. And I think that we've seen that in the numbers, like how many people play it who m probably didn't normally play games like that. That game's amazing too, I will <laughs> cool. Hi, I'm Justin. Uh, so there was a question earlier talking about, um, you know, first party providing accessibility tools to developer to make their lives easier. And I was just curious, do you think 
well, is there a point now where like maybe having accessibility features will become part of the certification process? So in order to ship this game, you need X. Does that exist right now? Or, and if it doesn't, do you see that happening anytime no. soon? We don't tell developers how to make games. You know? Yeah, I, it's really that simple. I mean, we're advocates, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, 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 there is no talk of making accessibility TCRs. I kind of hope we do it. <laughs> <laughs> Me I mean, too. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it, it's, I hope that it starts to feel pretty backwards to not include groups of people. Like I hope that people see the work that's been done. Maybe that it not become a requirement, but just one of those things that like becomes kind of standardized. That like if you're not including it, then you know, you're sort of behind. That's what that's what I'd like to have happen where it feels like it's a choice. Well I mean <laughs> we we talked about like yesterday carrots and sticks, right? We're much more interested in carrots than than sticks. Mm. Good question. Hello. Uh, my name is Fabian. I'm a lead UI artist on the next historical Total War, and I'm always thinking about ways to improve the accessibility. Um, the two most obvious things that come to mind is, you know, cl color blindness and proper subtitling standards. And I was just curious, if you had to pick one extra <laughs> accessibility feature, what would your favorite be? I, I, I can't do that. <laughs> They're all my favorite. <laughs> no, no it, I mean, you, you, it, it, it really does depend on the game that you're making. Um, but I mean, you picked out two great ones. Um, but yeah, it really depends on the title and the genre. Please make text bigger. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try. That's I, uh, I. I. There are many games I, I have to sit like centimeters from the screen in order to be able to read your text, and they're really great, well-written text. But if I can't read it, I'm going to pass by it, and I feel bad because that developer put uh, that writer put a lot of time and effort into it, and I don't. Just make it bigger, please. It's an interesting observation because, like, I come from the con console space where, you know, when you're sitting on a couch and you're playing a game, you need to have large text. But then when you move into a PC space where you work with other PC developers, the, the font size just drops dramatically. Like, mm -hmm. everyone wants to work with very tiny font sizes, especially in large strategy games. It's, yeah. <coughs> the font size thing, too, you're going to have the emergent benefit of... That's like you're, there's a lot of people that would like it to not be tiny illegible text. So you could maybe think about it that way if you're trying to weigh like cost benefit is like what's something that I'm going to definitely get you know some other emergent benefit from. Thank you. I don't think do we have any other questions? If we don't have any other questions, we might be able to have maybe a, a final. Uh, word from each of our panelists, and then we'll we'll break. Got anything? Uh, what do you got for us, Bryce? I, I really appreciate everybody um, and the questions that you've um, given us. And just know that if you have any more questions, I know that this is going to be new for a lot of people, and it's okay to ask. Um, so please ask. Uh, yeah, I feel the same. Like it. Um, I really appreciate when people reach out to me. Uh, I've had people make suggestions through Twitter, like. Um, one of the, the big ones we got that I'm pretty sure we implemented for Lost Legacy was um, options for mono audio. audio. Uh, so um, people who are deaf in just one ear, when you, when you design the game to be surround sound, they're missing like half of what you know, they're supposed to be hearing. And so that wasn't a thing that we ever considered, but somebody tweeted that at me. It was just one person was like, hey, could you do this? And so I went to the audio team and was like, can we do this? <laughs> they were like, yeah, well, you know, we'll look into doing that. So when like people reach out and start those conversations um, through Twitter or whatever, it actually really goes somewhere. And so if you have questions about it, um, there's like a huge community that you can tag. Um, at, it's like A11Y, right, Ally? That's, a, that's like how you kind of access the um, accessibility community through Twitter. And there are gonna be so many people that are gonna like wanna answer your questions and help you out. Um, as well as like there's Reddit groups and forums and all sorts of things that, um, that are available to you. Um, I wanted to say, that first off, I, I, as a gamer, uh, I appreciate the work that goes into making a game. I'm not, uh, I, I don't understand sort of the, the hostility that can be made from players to game developers, because uh, it's like, it, this is your passion just as much as it is ours when we get to play your final product. 
Um, so I do uh, appreciate, and I'm honored that, uh, that I was asked to be here today to, to speak to you. Uh, I know for myself that uh, whenever I'm playing games, I, want, like, I, I, I feel like I'm included too. And I feel like that my, my lack of vision when I'm playing a game that I enjoy, that I'm able to play, it makes me feel like I'm included. And, I'm, and, and in, a, in a weird way, it makes me feel like that I'm normal. And it, like, uh, for me, this, my vision is my normal. So uh, I, it's hard for me to explain kind of how I'm able to see. But being able to play a game that my friends are able to play and they're getting the, uh, the, and I find out they're getting the same experience that I'm getting when I play your games. Uh, that to me means the world because, it again, it feels like that I'm, I'm included. Uh, and so I uh, thank you from, for, uh, from the bottom of my heart uh, of doing the work that you do. And I will love to play all your games uh, from <laughs> here on out. Uh, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, to cover this sort of representation question again, um, so inspired by what you said, Bryce, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions. I know, so I think um, I've been aware of sort of developers who thought, oh, like I can't, I don't necessarily want to um, include this type of character because I'm worried about getting it wrong, right? Um, if that is your concern, you know, just reach out to reach out to people. There are plenty of people I can think of who offer their services as sort of consultants on on stuff like that. So, um, you know, ask around on Twitter, find out who they are. Um, yeah, and you know, don't be don't be afraid to ask questions. That's an awesome way to end it.